The following are excerpts from part two of an interview by Alex Vesely, director of Wizard of the Desert, courtesy of Noetic Films. For more information, please go to the Wizard of the Desert movie.com. For more information about Milton Erickson, please go to Milton Erickson DVDs.com. Thank you. Well, I think what you said, what he does is he teaches by giving people the experience. His whole way of thinking has to do with experiential learning and using people's experience of all of the things that they've accomplished to be resources that he can then work with when he works with people. But his way of working with people is the use of silence, rhythm, all the things that you could see, and yet what he's really doing, in my opinion, is when he uses silence, there is a kind of rhythm and a beat that he is kind of segueing into people's less visible uh, awareness, that he somehow always manages to tune into on some level. And so all, which I think has a lot to do with the fact that he's in trance and that he, his experience of his own unconscious is so profound that when you're in his presence, it's possible for you to go much more deeply within your own self than you possibly could just listening to somebody tell a speech. What he's doing is he's sharing his own state of being connected and accepting his own unconscious in such a way, as I see it, that he makes it easy for people to really move into areas that they may never have been in before. Erickson was a profound observer. I think he may have learned that when he had polio and couldn't move from the neck down. And he had uh, seven, or eight, seven brothers and sisters, and he spent his whole days watching people, watching the whole activity in the household. And uh, I think that he saw, I don't ever think I heard him say it, but I think that he saw that what people said and what their body said didn't always match. And he always went for the body. And I think that he was able to see people or see in people their relationship to their bodies on an unconscious level. And very often in the work with them, he would reframe what he saw in this relationship that they had unconsciously with their bodies. Uh, an example is um, the girl with the space between her two front teeth, which she hated, which was really the reason why I got, went to Erickson in the first place. Okay. That particular case. Okay, what can you tell about, about this case? I'm sorry? Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's, I read, i back up, the reason I found Erickson was because I'd worked 10 years at Mount Sinai Hospital, and what was happening was, that, as I saw it, people really were not getting, they were getting a little better, but not really, and they would be back in the hospital very often after they improved a little. And I was in Central Park, and I was reading Uncommon Therapy, Jay Haley's Uncommon Therapy, and the case of the girl with the space between her two front teeth hit me so hard that I decided, I don't know where he is, I don't know how I'm going to find him. I have to find somebody who could think this clearly, could be this humane, and be so completely in touch with a way of giving this little girl, young girl, she was 19, an experience that could truly, truly generalize to her whole life. And it was really the hated space between the two front teeth that made it possible, that w the way he worked with her, and I hate to tell people you ought to read it because it's just, it's just mind-blowing the way, no doctor that I ever knew could ever have thought that one up. And so that's why I wanted to go and find him, because I felt that something, there was just something. I just, I, I think a lot of people felt that way. There's that girl, there's the, there are many, many people that, the little girl that was um, 
lovely young girl that had been in a terrible accident in a wheelchair and very depressed. I think it's on one of the tapes. And um, he talks to her and tells her that she, she has a dimple on her chin, or her cheek, which um, she, he barely could see because she smiled so little. And somehow he had this ability to give people something in their bodies or something in their connection with their physiology that went with them daily so that, that he got into that pattern and changed the pattern because it was there in their consciousness all the time even when they weren't aware of it. And that's what he did. There was a wonderful one, which is one of my favorite ones, was the lady with the big fat fanny. And I'm not going to tell you about that one because that, that's a long one too. But there are so many, not all, there are many, many other ways that he worked. But this was one of the things that he observed about people, that he could see how they, what they liked about themselves, what they didn't like about themselves, how they felt about their own abilities. He, could, he managed to... Um, tune into that in a way and then reframe it in, in, in hypnosis. But it was always a reframe that they could take with them. And so, so was that the reason why he would choose something physical because you would, uh, you would sort of always have that with you? Well, I think in those cases, now that's not, you know, I mean, he didn't do that with every patient. I mean, this is just one of the hallmarks that I see over and over again in the work that he's done that he can see something that is um, very, very fundamental in the way a person feels about him or herself. And he, t he handles that so gently, very often with humor, very often with um, telling the truth always, but in a way that the person can walk away holding something that's totally different in terms of the way they feel about that, which then generalizes to the way they feel about themselves. And how do you think this related to his uh, early experience, early in life experience of, uh, of, of the para paralysis that he suffered after polio? I you know, I've done a lot of interviews. I, someday I'll get them all together. Um, Carl Whitaker said that he thought that Erickson, one of the reasons he was such a genius was that when he had polio, and couldn't feel his body, that he had some kind of ways that he made connections that he otherwise might not have made or that people couldn't ordinarily make. I think that he is so comfortable with, um, there's a case where there is a man who has a, he's a doctor who has a, and who does hypnosis, he had a hand levitation with Erickson. And uh, at one point he got nervous. He said, I, I, want my, I can't feel my arm, I can't feel my hand, I want my hand back. And um, I think that Erickson was so familiar with the feeling of not having feeling, physical feeling, that it didn't scare him. And he was so comfortable with it that when he worked with other people, he knew they were fine. He, the guy w was no problem <laughs> getting his hand back. But um, it, that he knew himself so well in this regard, in, not, in knowing what it felt like not to be able to move, not to have any kind of physical sensation that can be very scary to people. And he was so comfortable with it because he, well, he taught himself how to walk again. And so, and he used it, you know, he used it when he was paralyzed to Im imagine milking a cow, using the pitchfork. And his, uh, it's a story that I'm sure a lot of people have talked about that he would think about that when he was, was strapped in a rocking chair and the rocking chair began to rock. So he knew on some level that something was happening in terms of his thinking. Right. I want to get back to your, um, to, to your story of how you got to know him. So you read that case and you thought, I, I need to see this man. Oh, yeah. And how did you find him? And uh, what did you think uh, when, you, when you first did meet him? And how was that maybe different from what you expected? Um, I saw this book. <laughs> I read this case. And at that time, I was, had done a lot of psychoanalysis many years of it, and um, 
I was studying TA and Gestalt with a group. And in that group one night, Steve Langton comes in with tapes of Erickson. It was a, um, not, short, not long after I made up my mind I'm going to find Erickson. Things happen like that sometimes. He came up and here's this man I've been looking all over for. Yeah. And so I asked Steve, I said, well, can anybody go and study with him? And he said, call him up. So I called him up and I said, can I come? And he said, I send me a letter. I sent him a letter and I went. He, I could go. And I let, was there for two weeks sitting around with a group of people and all well, with the tape recorders going. And he talked. And that's all there was. It was a small room. It was next to his office. And of course, I would go home at night and half the time we, I'd be so tired, I, uh, a lot of us wouldn't even have dinner. Something was working. I got home. I changed my life when I got home. I cannot tell you how I was just easily doing all these things that I hadn't thought of doing and making decisions. And I realized it had something to do, there, there's a case of a girl, of the, um, the African Violet Queen, and this was a metaphor that he talked about while we were in trance. And one night I found three African Violets on my night table. I have no idea how they got there. I must have gotten them. I must have gotten into trance. How they got there, I'm sure, had something to do with that metaphor. So I called him up and I said, I, I want to come back. I don't know what you've done, but I really want to learn. And can I bring a video? And he said, yes. He gave me permission. So I'm not, I'm not, a, not so great with machines. And um, I got the tripod. I got the camera. I got the VCR. I, I schlepped it. That's a New York phrase. I schlepped it all to, to Arizona. Went there a day before, bunch of people helped me, taught me what, how to do it. First day, I, it was fine, except I didn't have any sound, so I had to go back and get more lessons and came back. And, and the, the tapes that we have, that I have, are the, the next day, the beginning of the next day. And uh, I sat there behind the camera for two weeks. And uh, it was probably the most profound experience. Well, I've had a lot of experiences, but it's never left me. And I think most people that were around Erickson um, have been affected the same way. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it was, but I, as I look at these tapes, I can see more and more levels and levels that he was able to connect both with himself, but also on a kind of rhythm with the people he was working with. And what comes through is his humanity. What comes through is the, he could be tough. And um, profoundly honest. He could say things to people that nobody else could get away with. And he'd say them so kindly that people could hear them. For example? Well, the example of the, uh, I think she was um, a nurse or a clerk in the hospital of the lady with the big fat fanny. Um, she, Erickson observed her over a long period of time. And she, he, at one point he saw her walking down the hall and she swung her fanny and almost knocked somebody down. And so uh, he, another time he saw that when she had a holiday, a, a day off, she would be in the hospital grounds and she would ask mothers to babysit for their children. And so then, I, I don't know, sometime later, uh, she got hiccups, terrible hiccups, and they didn't know what to do with her. And so she was hospitalized because they were really that bad. And um, he was asked to go and see her or he decided to go and see her, I don't know. Uh, and he, he went, I don't want to spoil these things for people. No, no, that's it. I can, I can cut. So. Okay. Um, he went and he, uh, he closed the door to the room and he told her to be quiet and she wouldn't like what he was going to say. And then he said, uh, you have the biggest, fattest fanny I have ever seen, and you don't like it. Something like that. I don't want to misquote him. 
and uh, something again, and then he said, uh, don't you know that there are many men who see a big fat fanny and uh, see a beautiful cradle for children? And then he told her to stop, not to stop hiccuping yet, to spontaneously let go of that. And that's all he said. And a year later, she comes and she, oh, no, then when there was a resident that um, saw her down, walking down the hall and came into Erickson and said, who's that lady? And Erickson said, I'm not a matchmaker, but the bus stop that she stands at every afternoon is over there. And, a year, and the girl comes later with an engagement ring. And he had bought a house with a lot of bedrooms because he wanted a lot of children. That seems to be a common theme also that he, he made matches or people would uh, end up getting married. That's right. He, yeah. And, I, and it's, I think they're really true. A lot of people say it can't be possible, but I think some, I'm sure that they're all true. Um, he, he was kind of optimizing people's lives somehow. Is that a way to put it? I think he did it all the time. And I think he did it, you know, and many times on unconscious levels. I think that's why so many people came away from him um, much more in charge of themselves and not knowing why, but they went out and they did things that they might not otherwise have done. I think Erickson was so observant that he, um, he saw things that in people tuned into it sort of in, in, in an intuitive way, but I think it was because he didn't miss anything. He didn't miss anything when I was there. And he's seeing right through you. Isn't that scary? No, it's not scary at all because he was never invasive. He was never, I, or my experience of him was that he was never invasive. Although there are some cases that he took some very um, stern uh, positions with. Uh, there was a Nazi general, ex-general, who was flown in and I, it, said, it was said that he didn't really want to see him, and, um, but he would. And so the general's in a wheelchair with a hysterical paralysis of the leg. And uh, Erickson's standing at his desk, and the general comes in, and Erickson says, you are the worst Jew-hating son of a bitch. It called him every name, all kinds of things, much worse than what I'm saying, no doubt. And the general got so mad that he jumped out of the chair to go over and strangle Erickson. I mean, he was willing to do things like that which is, would be very hard for some people to do. Big Ruth in a hospital, there was a six foot six lady. You probably have heard some of these stories. It would say she was a lady from Worcester, Massachusetts that used to go on a rampage about every six weeks and tear down street lights and throw uh, trash cans around and mess up the city. And they were spending a lot of money having to repair it after Big Louise's rampage. And they finally sent her to the hospital. And she started doing it in the day room in the hospital. So they came to, uh, wanna, should I? I can stop it. It's stop so. day room. So uh, Erickson they w was asked to see her, and um, she came down and he asked her what, how, what, what brought these things on, and she said, I don't know. I just they just come on. I don't know where they're coming on. They're just coming on, and so he made a deal with her that the next he wouldn't hurt her, and he wouldn't shoot her full of thorazine. Uh, that what he'd do is he would want to talk to her. So before the next time was coming on, would he please call, would she please call him? So she called him, he said, I'll meet you in the day room. And then he had prearranged for the whole hospital staff to go into the day room and tear it apart. Curtains, chairs, you know, and the, and the whole, <laughs> <laughs> nurses, everybody, they're tearing this thing apart. And she is running around stopping, stopping. And Dr. Erickson, get them to stop. She couldn't stand to have them do it. She never did it again. Wow. And the story was that she came to him about, I don't know, maybe two, three, three or four weeks later or something and said, listen, I'm tired of being around all these crazy people. Can you, and he got her a job down in the basement and apparently there was some wonderful, great, big, six-foot-eight guy 
Um, and uh, they started dating and he said they got married and probably split a six pack of beer every weekend or something, two six packs of beer. <laughs> Um, so there are many, many stories like that, but the real basis of the stories has to do with, um, well, with Big Louise, it's people seeing their own behavior and really seeing it. And um, I know that in some cases, I've heard of people getting very, being gotten very drunk and having to see themselves on video, and they'd never get drunk again. I mean, if it's that bad, if yeah. you really see yourself in that kind of a state. But there, there's always some kind of real meaningful thing behind it that has to do with how we feel about ourselves and how we often don't know it. It seems like you can, you can derive a lot of theories, you can derive a lot of uh, um, uh, maneuvers that he did brilliantly by observing what he did. Um, is this something that you think he he learned? Is he learned like you know? Is this is this knowledge that can be taught, or is it art? What is it? Uh, that's hard. That's a really hard question to answer. I think that um, one of the things that he, it goes back to his ability to observe and his respect for silence. You know, we live in the age of sound bites and talking heads and I mean everything is speeded up and we forget that, that as someone once said, God is the space between thoughts and that when people go into trance there is a time change. Can be. You can, spe you can speed up time, you can spend it, spread, it, spread it out. Yeah. and. Um, I think that he knew that, that if it's true, then on some very, very subatomic level, there is still some kind of rip pulsing rib energy or rhythm that goes on in terms of um, human connection. That he somehow, I think, uses silence to clue into that in a kind of a way, if that making any sense. Um, this gets into other areas. Interesting. Well, um, but I think that he was very aware that probably the most powerful communication is done in silence. With the use of silence. With the use of silence. That the that the connection the silent connection between human beings that cannot even be described is what transforms people. What that it's the it's it's beyond quote feeling, but it's a it it has to do with some kind of vibration or some kind of um, something that we don't understand yet. Well, I, yeah, I have people say that some of the things uh, might even, I mean, you would call it a psychic. But some people thought he was psychic, uh, that he was tapping into, as you say, things we, we cannot display on a to explain on a scientific basis. Yet he always rejected that. He said he's not doing anything that uh, out of the ordinary. So to speak. I think that he, I don't think you know, the word psychic conjures up so many other um, definitions that various people have. I think that he just took what he did as like uh, doesn't everybody. I think he knew he was power. I mean, he was powerful, but I don't think that he. Um, I never had this feeling that he was thought himself. There, there was something very, very um, self-accepting in him that was very human. I mean, he said he used to punish himself. He said the unconscious can be punished, can be punishing if he did something that, it, that he shouldn't have or something. And he would punish himself, and what he hated doing the most was to um, take books out of the bookcase and dust them. 
and or he'd say he'd go, and, and, and this was because there was a sculptor in the room that we had, but he said he would punish himself to go out. He'd go out and he'd look at the clouds, and he would really, really try hard to see, as the clouds changed their shape, what the clouds wanted. What the clouds wanted? Wanted. Meaning that, and that was a way of, he's talking to a group of therapists. And you see, I think one of the major contributions that he's made is that he um, re is profoundly aware, and this gets into some other territory, I think he's profoundly aware of the shifts of consciousness that people have. And he's, Larry Lachan's just written this book on landscape of the mind. And he, he talks about uh, domains of consciousness. He talks about taxonomy of consciousness. But basically, that we, when we shift our states of consciousness, we're very rarely, a, unless we learn, we are never aware that go, we go from one state to another. And, and I think he was profoundly aware of it. And he would move with it, of course. And he would guide it, I think. That's why some of the silences, some of the shifting, you can notice whenever he shifts, there's always the end of something, the beginning of something else. When he moves forward, his, his movement very often is uh, very congruent with everything that he does. Um, but he kind of does it because that's who he is. He doesn't, I don't think, um, I never knew him well at all. I just knew him from those, the, the um, experience I had with him. But what, from what I hear, he could be very powerful with people. I think he, some people were afraid of him because of his particular way of um, not, he was not too good with fools. With, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, he, and he rejected some patients. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think he didn't like uh, falseness. And um, I think he, when somebody was authentic, he picked it up right away and he trusted it and he respected it. And the person knew it. I think that he would go to the, for the court, for the, he would go, whenever he talked to somebody, he would talk to the best in them and or the part of them that he knew he could help them reframe in terms of the way they felt about themselves. And it was very, it was much more right brain, even though he, I think he was brilliant and he wrote many, many papers and did all kinds of uh, experiments and was uh, uh, meticulous in his description of detail, which sometimes would bore people into a trance. You know, he would do it on purpose. And he, he widely read and just enormously, I mean, interesting to listen to. He had all kinds of facts and figures, some of which I, were just amazing, and some of which I don't know whether he kind of made up once in a while. You know, he had a great sense of humor and a, a sense of um, the absurdity of life. And, um, but enormous, um, I think people could feel his compassion and he didn't, he didn't mess around with detail. And if somebody said something that was not, and it happens in these, if somebody says something that's kind of off base or would distract and go off into some other, he would just ignore it. 